Okay, so um, from today's lecture, the code is available in the Hello World folder in the uh, main repository for the course. And it demonstrates, yeah, the, the, the Hello World that we did, um, that we did uh, yesterday. And with command being the executables and then utils being kind of the, the main module, the, the main package of the module. So the module consists of two packages. Uh, one package is called um, hello world and one package is called main inside the command. So we have two packages, main and hello world. In the package main, we have some functions, some utilities. Those are not executables. And then in the package main, we have the executables. And then there was a question yesterday, what is a package, what is a module? It is kind of confusing in Golang. Uh, in Golang, they started without the concept of modules and everything was a package, right? So everything um, that you export outside was called package and you could have a concept of a package which consists of other packages, right? So if I go, go lang, go lang.org, if we go to the documentation um, and if I go, um, Yeah, those are the um, those are all the articles I want. Where is the um, package documentation? Yeah. So if you go to your package documentation, they call everything packages. So even the packages that contain other packages are called packages, right? Uh, and it, you would say, yeah, that's the same as a module, right? A module is a collection of packages. And so is a package, which is a collection of other packages. <laughs> so, you know, um, if, if you try to categorize it in this way, it sort of doesn't work. Uh, so what, you know, how should you categorize it? Well, it, it's kind of a, a way of grouping things and distributing things on the internet for others to use. So the, uh, the concept of a package and module sometimes is used interchangeably because when you open, when, when you create your module and you kind of publish it, then it, from the user point of view, they can call it a package, which consists of other packages because you're kind of de facto distributing a package. Um, like I, I would distribute this and uh, call it a, you know, a package hello world, which exposes um, a particular function uh, capital H, which is exposed to the outside world and other people could use it, right? So I'm exposing this package, but I'm doing it by having a module, which has two packages. Uh, and you can, like, you should do it this way. Like there is a way of not using modules, but um, it's it's a mess. Like, uh, and that's why they came up with the concept of the modules. And that's why you have this go mod. And that's why we do it this way. Um, there is. One extra thing that I want to say about modules and the folder structures and packages. So in the course, what we do is we have kind of a top level project, uh, Git folder, where we put the subfolders. And that's the wrong way to do it. Like we should not do it this way because if you have a module, which is your Go module, it should be placed in a top level, um, top level folder. Um, and we only doing it because those those are examples of code which we not intend to re, to export to anybody, and we not kind of uh, making it a proper Go modules. They, they are just examples. So th th there is this note here explaining that if you doing Go module, you should place a Go module in its own Git repository. Um, and we violating it because we don't intend those two modules or other modules ever to be used publicly. Uh, we, we're just doing it for the sake of simpli simplicity such that you can pull the whole repo and you have those different examples. Um, I did an example of a project which um, uses another module. 
Uh, and if you go into Go mod, you will see that there is a dependency on uh, Chuck joke. And this Chuck joke um, I wrote yesterday, um, it's on GitHub. And it is a properly formatted Go module. It lives in a top level folder. It, and you can recognize it by seeing Go mod in the top level. Uh, and it has source code here. And it doesn't have any other folders because it's a very simple module. And this very simple module exposes two functions to the world. And those two functions is uh, get next joke value and get next joke. Um, and get next joke value returns a string and an error. And it's a next Chuck Norris joke. And then get next joke returns a struct, which has uh, some, some of the joke data inside it. And if you go to types, you will see that I'm using this um, random API for Chuck Norris jokes. So if you go to this API and you request, you you know, I, I just made a get request to this API, I get a JSON, um, a JSON joke, <laughs> Chuck Norris joke in JSON, uh, which has a couple of um, properties like categories created at you know, icon URL, URL, and a value. And this value is the actual text of the joke, right? Um, so this module that I've created um, uses the struct to parse this struct, this JSON object. And then the value is the actual joke such that there is a method which exposes it. So in my Example, I'm using the other module and I have this dependency on the other module. And then in the code, um, if you go to the source code, again, very simple, just simple main, I have this import. And this is the module name. So the module name consists of the host user and the kind of the package or module name. Uh, which is de facto that the module name actually is the whole thing, but we will refer to the to the um, imported functions via this uh, this handle, such that you can see I'm I'm doing some stupid printouts with hello world, and then I'm doing this joke joke dot get next joke value. I'm getting this uh, this string, which is the next Chuck Norris joke, by referring to my package by the last part of the of the name. Uh, and this is definitely a module, right? Uh, but some people will say, no, it's not really a module because you could use something else uh, and still import it this way because before modules were introduced to Golang, you still used to do it and you called it a package. Uh, so that's why it's confusing. Why it is a module? Because it has uh, the Go mod. If I didn't have the Go mod and you will find some packages uh, exposed publicly on internet without the Go mod. Uh, and then they are strictly speaking packages. If you have Go mod, this is strictly speaking a module, but it is also a package. So yeah, uh, it's a kind of a long rant about kind of confusing naming, naming of, of this uh, infrastructure. There was another thing called vendoring, which was making life even more complicated. Uh, but anyway, we using modules in this course. If you don't use modules, use modules because we will tell you off if you don't use modules. We will call modules modules, and then we will call what you are kind of using packages. So of course, Chuck is uh, Chuck joke is a package because if you look into my module and you go into types or the other one, it says Chuck joke is a package, right? So Chuck joke is a package but the whole thing is a module and it has a single package inside that module which is called chuck joke um, it's kind of a simple demo for uh, showcasing how to parse json and how to organize your dependencies uh, with modules so you know it is in the git repo as well it's called hello jokes um, and you can you can play with it whoops all right so let's go back to the lecture um, I like, let me start this. Yeah, I have IntelliJ started, so I will hide it for now here. Um, let's hide it for now. 
I don't need this to be seen and I need to start the presentation. And I have a question for you first. Oh yeah, I don't see your question. So I have to open that as well. So first there are some questions. Um, okay, what's the purpose of new slice? I will answer that in a moment. Um, how is the dot JSON read? I will answer that later also. Um, so there is a question from Sebastian. Uh, will there be a similar group system in the cloud GitLab as we have in advanced programming for storing our files? I will talk with Christopher after today and I will let you know. Uh, so I will check with Christopher what his suggestion is. I suspect that it will be the same, but um, yeah, we, we can discuss it with Christopher and I will let you know uh, in the next class. So uh, I'm keeping in mind the other two questions. I will address them in a moment. Uh, before I have a question for you first. So How many people we have? 54. So let's wait a little bit more. It's entirely anonymous, you know, no wrong answers here. And while you answering that, I will go to my um, project and address a Suzanne question about the new slices. So um, if I have a slice, um, so, so let's say I have a slice S which is a slice of ints. And now I, I have it and everything in Go is um, initialized, but I haven't kind of initialized it yet at all. So if I kind of try to print it, print line, let's print S. Um, by the way, there are multiple ways of printing stuff in, um, in Golang and one useful one is if you format, format the, uh, the printout that you want to do and for that you use print F and then you have kind of a format uh, text and then you have some values that you are formatting. So I can format S as a string, I can format S as a value and I can try to print as type. And uh, you have other kind of um, um, other formatting strings that you can use in your format. So here um, I have uh, as string just as value and then type, right? So we can uh, save that. Um, and it complains, yeah, because I said, uh, so why it complains, I said, I will have three things to print and I only given one thing here, right? So I have to say, I have three things, which are all S uh, and I would like a new line character at the end. So if I save it uh, again, uh, it has, so for S it complains that S is of type um, slice of ints and it cannot be printed as a string because it is not a string, right? I would need to cast it to a string. So printing something sometimes as a string is a bit uh, complicated because you kind of need to convert something that is not a string into a string and the print will not do it for you. Uh, so let's... Um, Let's try it. So let's try to convert whatever whatever S is into a string. 
And now it complains, yeah, well, I cannot really com convert uh, your <laughs> slice of ints into a string using the coercion. Uh, it's not really a string, it's not convertible to string. So, you know, let's like with this, we have to kind of give up, right? So we have to give up. Uh, and we say, okay, just print it as a value. Do whatever you have to do to print it, which de facto will convert it to a string. Uh, but, um, all right, so then it says, I cannot do a type of slice of int neither, right? So you see, like if I have any other type here, uh, so if I say, um, if I say S is int, uh, life is much simpler because then um, um, so what is yeah maybe I'm doing it wrong maybe the yeah let's let's skip it my my point was not about types but I might be doing something wrong here with the type um, so I do this, then it will work, and then we will, yeah, but let's print the slice. So let's do slice. All right, so if I um, if I go to my terminal and if I go uh, go run hello where I am um, Yeah, so go run main.go. Okay, so it kind of prints um, prints an empty slice. Um, and then you have uh, the this slice is initialized and it's empty and it is depicted as a um, as a slice that is initialized, but it's empty. It's kind of slice that has um, certain capacity and certain length, and the length is zero, uh, but the capacity, we don't know. We can check what capacity that's, that uh, slice has by uh, printing extra things. So if I print, um, so if I go here and print, um, yeah, I mean, you know, as a string and as a value doesn't makes, uh, difference here because we cannot sort of render it as a string. Uh, so I can print it as a value and I can print another value, which is the cap capacity of our string is uh, some other value. And I would say capacity of, um, of that, right? So if I go here and I rerun it, uh, you will see that the capacity is also zero. So I have a slice, but it has a zero capacity and zero length. Um, what if I say, um, so what if I say that my S is equal to nil, right? I can do that. And it says, um, oh yeah, it's not a new variable. So then if I go here and I run it again, um, it says, well, it, it is the same, right? Um, so you see that um, there is some, um, some magic going on that the nil slice has zero length and zero capacity, which is equivalent for my initial um, initial declaration of slice, which was zero length, zero capacity, and I didn't do anything with it. So that one was originally initialized and it is kind of initialized to nil and nil is the same as the, uh, as the zero capacity, zero uh, length slice. Uh, so it is kind of like a synonym um, and you can use it to, uh, to check if your slice is really nil or if your slice is only zero length, but it had has certain capacity, right? Because I can do, um, so if I go here, I can, um, I can say S, make S um, a slice of ints, which is zero length, but it has thousand capacity, right? Uh, and that is not nil anymore. So this one, this S is not nil because I have 
pre-allocated certain capacity for it. And if we kind of run it, and if we do this, so I comment that out, I write it, I go here, I run it again. Uh, you see that you know my slice is empty, but it has certain capacity. So to differentiate between slices that are kind of there, but they have zero length, and slices that are not there at all, you, you, you can have a nil slice, right? So that's kind of the answer for your, um, for Suzanne question about nil. Um, I hope that kind of addresses. Nil is, is, is really, um, uh, let me, come on. So let me exit that and let me quit. We, yeah, let's write it. Maybe I will reuse it. Yeah, so I, for, um, mis by mistake, st stop that. I hope it will not um, change anything here. Somehow I pressed something that, um, uh, please work. Yeah, good. So most of you didn't do the tour. And there are still some people who don't know what it is, uh, which is a shame, right? Uh, please check the lecture from yesterday and please do go tour. Um, I have 17 students who did the tour. I have a couple of uh, follow-up questions that uh, relate to Golang if you did the tour, but if you haven't done entire tour, I hope you are in this category, but you at least looked at it, right? So you're saying I haven't done the whole tour, but I kind of checked a little bit about Golang. So I have a um, couple of questions about Go. Uh, but before I, I do, I have a question to you. Like if you have any questions to me uh, about um, um, Go Tour and as, as Suzanne had about something. Uh, and I had enabled it throughout the, the Mentimeter. So I, I never done it before uh, such that you can ask questions in the Mentimeter, hopefully, uh, throughout. Um, so if you do have questions, then ask, and we'll see how it works. Um, for the Go, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, and the first one is quite hard. How to initiate B to a slice of ints one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four in a single line of code? How can you do that? So. Yeah, there is a proposal uh, already, very good, uh, which we can test. So let's try it. So let's say s equals a slice of ints with the round bracket of two, three, and four. And I will delete that, we'll delete that, we'll delete that, and we'll save it. And it says uh, uh, too many arguments in conversion to a slice of ints. So we have another proposal which says this, which says, oh, come on four and then uses the curly braces all right um let's save that and check and it says yep great but so the um, i'm doing the yellow here but that's not a slice uh what is it you can uh you can answer in the Zoom chat. What is this? What is S here? Perfect, Eric. S is an array. Arrays and slices are different. Array is something fixed, fixed size, and it never changes the size. It can change the values inside, but it, it doesn't change the size. Whereas the slice is something that has a length and a capacity and it can change the length. Uh, and we can resize the, the slice too. Uh, so slices and arrays are different. And the S here is, a, is an array. 
to make it into a slice. Uh, so let's wait. Yes, so we have uh, this blue one, uh, which is the correct answer. Uh, the difference between these two is that um, the slice doesn't have the, you know, the size of the array. The arrays have the size. And um, uh, by the way, you, you do need the int. Um, you do need to say what type of uh, array it, it is. And then the slices don't. And also you can, instead of saying var b equals, you can say b equals with the uh, uh, semicolon, um, with, with the colon here, like I, I, I am doing, and it is equivalent, right? So if I do this, then I have a slice, right? Uh, so that's the correct answers. That that is the correct answer. Uh, the the same answer with var is you know var equals and the same right. It, it is this, those two lines are equivalent. It's that the syntactic sugar, and it is more idiomatic to use this initialization with declaration because it kind of stands out um, and it it is a little bit yeah. Uh, I mean both are correct and both are fine. It, it, it's just that the, the one like this is a bit more go-ish. It's like more like go, right? Um, I will do a trick here and ask you another question. So let's say I have S, which is an array. Uh, and then I will make, you know, um, so, you know, if, if I do S of one, what 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 is it? So if I check equality, if I say if s of one is, and I want this to be true, so what what it will be here? I uh, use the chat uh, Zoom chat to say. So what is s of one? S of one is two exactly because we index things as in normal programming languages from zero. Uh, so zero is one, one is two, right? Uh, all good. Okay, so let me do uh, that. I will reassign. Um, I will reassign s of one to be twenty. Right. Um, I can do that, and then if we print um, print the the array, we will have one twenty three four. Right. Um, so now I will do. I'm annoyed with this. So I will do another array. I will call it ss. And I will say SS is S, right? So I'm kind of assigning S to SS. And I do that SS of one is now 40. And then we will print SS. So I will use print. And I will say um, S is, and we will print value of s and then i will say ss is and i will print a value of ss and now the question is um what do you expect um what do you expect to see i'll write it uh, of course i have to say i'm uh, declaring so I forgot the um, I I forgot the colon. So uh, okay, and now we have it correct. I will uh, start the terminal in here as well, such that we can run it. And before we run it, um, no. So SS is initialized. It 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 will compile. I can build it. Go build main dot go. It builds, I have an executable. Um, so I have executable called main, I can call it. So it works, a SS is initialized uh, because I added, yeah, initially it, it wouldn't work because I, I have this, it wouldn't compile and, and the compiler complained. So I fixed, so, um, so now it works. What do you expect to see? Um, do you expect to see that S and SS are the same or do you expect to see that they are different? So um, Carol and Suzanne expect that to be different. Uh, and if you are coming from um, C or C++ world, you would expect them to be different, right? 
Um, so let's let's run it, and they are different. So S has twenty uh, because I said S is twenty, so I changed the original one, and then I assigned it. Um, and then SS was 20, but I changed SS to 40, and now S stayed with 20 and SS is 40. Why the hell is that, right? Um, it is because SS, um, arrays in um, arrays in Golang are value types. They are not um, they are not objects. <laughs> they are not kind of structs. They are not anything complex, they are just value, right? So arrays in Golang are values. And because I did this assignment, I assigned a value to SS, but S and SS are different values, right? So it, it you know, what other value types do you know? Um, so if I go back here, so it's, it's the same as me saying, um, so if I say I have A, which is an int uh, and it is, 10 and I have B, which is also an int, which is A, right? And then if I print them, if I print A and B, both will be 10. But if I say now B is 20, right? Ah, come on. Oh, 20, 29, or, you know, 20. And I print A and B, A is still 10 and B is 20, right? Because those are primitive types. Those are kind of value types. Uh, and in C and in Golang and everywhere else, that's uh, value types and they will behave like this, that B will be 20, A will be 10. Uh, but with arrays, in most languages, arrays as objects are not value types, such that if I do this, I kind of pass the reference to the original array. And then if I manipulate this, it will update the SS and it will update S. And that's what will happen in C or C++. But in Golang, it's a value type, right? So now, what will happen if I change it to a slice? So now I do that, that and I save it, and it's a slice now. It's not an array. W what you would expect to be printed this time? Well, if you listen to me, uh, and if you did the, the tour, uh, the key here was, is a slice a value or is it an object? And um, yeah, let's build it and let's run it. And well, now they are the same. We have 40, we, we've changed first element of SS to be 40, which automatically changed the um, the, the, the first element of S as well. And the giveaway here is the, you know, um, why, why slices are not, um, why slices are not value types and arrays are value types. Well, you remember I, I said you can have a slice which is nil, which has zero capacity and some capacity. Uh, I, I mean, nil uh, has zero length and zero capacity and you can have a slice of length zero, but of certain capacity, which suggests that there is something on going on with, with slices. It's not just a value. It's something additional to the value that we have. We have this capacity, right? We have a length and the capacity. Uh, and the capacity and the length kind of suggest that, you know, slices are objects. They, they are not kind of a value types in, in Golang and that confirms it, right? So. This is uh, somewhat confusing in Go, especially if you're coming from C or C++ or Java even, uh, because you would expect this assignment to be by reference. You are, you know, uh, SS is, the, is a reference to the same array, uh, whereas it isn't. Where, whereas if you change it to a slice, it is a reference to the same slice. And then by doing this line, you're changing a single location, which both S and SS point to. Whereas if I do it as an array, it's like a primitive value type, and it's like two values which have nothing in common. They don't point to the same location in, in memory. Uh, they are just, you know, value types. Um, so yeah, um, that's the kind of an explanation here. Um, so array is a copy and a slice is a reference. Yes, you can, you can sum, sum up the whole discussion like that. 
So this line is like uh, assignment of reference to the slice, whereas in the um, in the value, it's a yeah, it's a new kind of a, it, it, it's copied by value. Uh, it's it's it makes a copy uh, because it's a value type. So we always uh, we cannot reference values. Values are just you know if if I say two, if, when I when I did this. Um, so when I did um, a is an integer and it's two, I, I cannot have a reference to two. Two is a value and I, you know, I, I cannot point to it. Um, right. Um, all right. So that's, that's it. Uh, let's move on uh, with the testing. Um, so let's see. This, these ones, uh, so the previous question was not based on your identity and it was not tracking of how you're doing. This one, fr from now on, some of the questions will kind of track. So I have a simpler question and you can um, answer it and then we'll have a leaderboard. So the question is, whoops, whoops, I wrong, wrong button. And I will tidy up here. So this should be uh, extremely straightforward. Uh, so some of you were very close, like uh, that is almost correct, but it was just, just asking about the type, right? So not about the variable, but about the type. So this one is correct, but uh, you don't need that part. Um, and that one is almost correct. You just use the wrong brackets. So square brackets uh, in Golang. Um, I'm, I'm getting confused with uh, programming languages and the use of square curly brackets. Um, uh, square curly and round brackets. Uh, in Golang, we uh, use square brackets a lot and we use curly brackets for initialization and we only use round brackets for the parameters of functions most of the time. So remember about that. So this one almost correct, um, but not quite. So leaderboard will be quite bad because none of them, none of, none of you made it perfectly. Uh, so now another one, which should be easy because, you know, um, we just discussed the answer, which was on the previous one. So if you fast, you know the answer. And if you listen to the previous one, you know what to do. And funny enough, it asks about M as well, like, like the answer from the previous one. So so different programming languages have different key data structures and key control flow elements, right? Um, perfect. So, um, so declare and in initiate M that is a map of uh, strings to ints, right? So um, we have, uh, uh, we have, the, th those are correct. Um, it's just that, yeah, let me, let me just double, ch double check it. So, if I say that M is a map of string, oops, string to int. Um, yeah, so it kind of complains because um, yes, M is of that type, but what is the value of M? We, we didn't say, like we didn't, um, specify how to initiate in, initiate it, right? So it would be fine if I said it's a var and I um, I have a type, 
right? So this is fine. Um, uh, 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 no equals. So this is fine. We say, um, yeah, it, it, it is fine. It just complains that M is not used, right? Um, but when we say, uh, when we when we do with uh, initialization, so um, if we say this, then we need M to become something. We, we're not des describing just the type of M, we have to say what M is. And for that, you, you kind of need the, the curly braces, right? So you, you need to say it's an empty map of strings, right? Uh, so now it's fine. It complains that M is not used, but it, it is like a full e expression of what M is before it was just the type, right? So this, this is almost correct. If you edit the curly braces, that, that would be correct. Um, and uh, a simpler way or more um, idiomatic way is just to use make, right? So you, you use make and then you use the type expression inside, right? Um, so th this one, and this one and this one and all, all of the, the, the answers that are like this would be fine if you added the curly braces uh, or because the question was declare and initiate, right? So um, if I say var m int int. So this is a declaration. And then if I say m equals an empty one, that's the initialization. And we can do it in a single line by declaring and initializing using the uh, this notation. But then we need to put the curly braces at the end, right? Uh, or as suggested by the answer, we use make. Um, can you use an uppercase s for string? No, you cannot because this is the the uh, Golang is case sensitive, and it distinguishing it, it distinguishes uh, the uh, the case. So if I say string, it and save it, it will say uh, I. Uh, yeah, there are multiple errors. I cannot <laughs> show you the error, but it will complain like I don't know what you mean. What what is string? We haven't declared it, right? If I said um, that I have a type. I have a type string, which is a struct, right? Then it would have uh, one less error and it will say, um, um, yeah, it doesn't like that neither because I may not be able to use, uh, yeah, I have to say it's, a, I might need to say that it's a struct. Um, I don't remember what is the syntax for making structs uh, keys in the in the map. Ah, here, that's the problem. Uh, so syntax is probably fine. Uh, if I save it, um, yeah. So th this one is fine as long as I initiate it with this, right? So now it 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 will work. Uh, it will say, yeah, you know, I know what string is because string is just an empty struct. Uh, but if I use lowercase, it knows string is a is a string which I mean in Golang. It's a type which is a different type than capital string, right? Um, yeah. So the <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, that 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 is a wrong answer because that needs to be a small s. Yeah. Correct. I I didn't I didn't realize that was the the capitalized um, s. Of course, it has to be lowercase uh, string. Yeah, sorry, um, didn't notice that. All right, so next one. Um, that should be very easy. Yeah, we're not doing too well with time. I'm um, digressing too much. So given that M is the map of string to ints, just print value of the int for Tom. Uh, super simple. So we have to speed up a little bit. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it could could be print, could be print, could be uh, print line. Uh, so this one is correct. Um, there are no other correct ones. So at least we have uh, a person who hit the, the correct mark. Uh, yeah, we just uh, use again square brackets and we put the key inside and we get the value out of it, right? Simple. Uh, congratulations here. So the next one is a little bit more complex and I'm asking to do it in a single line, which makes it also a little bit complex. So you may not find the correct answer straight away, but uh, try it out. So we, um, so we asking, okay, check if the M has Tom inside. And if it does, if our map has Tom as a key, just print, print line okay. So yes, you will have to use if statement and you will have to use a certain way of, of an if statement to do it in a single line. So I will explain here. This, this one is quite important. So um, okay, so no one got it right, but let's check if some people have, no one had it remotely correct, <laughs> okay? Um, so the, the, the way if we check, so if M is my, um, so again, let's, let's do it. So M is uh, make, it's my map between uh, ints and strings. And I have, I can initialize it here. So I can initialize, initialize it to empty map, or I can say I have uh, Marius, which is uh, 21, and I have Tom, which is 40. Um, then I can save it. I hope it will work. Uh, it doesn't like something. So I'm doing the syntax wrong. I expected semicolon. What? So let's see. Um, Yeah, too little time. Yeah, that's cool. Sorry for that. Uh, let me find the, uh, what's the, do I use semicolon here? No, I don't think so. So make, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I screw it up. Uh, so it's probably fine. Uh, so it's probably comma. Uh, I screw it up because I don't need make, right? Make makes an empty map and doesn't initialize it. What I want is I want to initialize it with curly braces, so I don't need map. I don't need make. So now, yeah, it's it's fine. So then the syntax was fine. As I told you, like go most of the time, you will guess the syntax. <laughs> At least I, I'm quite good in guessing it. So um, now, if I want to check if M has certain key, right? So I I need to. Um, so if I put um, if I put Adam here, and if I say if M from of Adam is, um, and now I like to check, you know, if Adam is there, I have to check if the value of Adam is something that distinguishing it from um, the value that don't exist, right? So I could say zero because ints, you know, um, if, if I have everything here that is, um, different than zero, that would be a test if Adam is in my map or not. But if I allow values to be zero, like if uh, Marius is zero, then you know uh, this will say true because the default value for non-existing thing is zero uh, because the default value for int is zero and I cannot distinguish if Adam is there with zero or if Adam is not there at all, right? So to, to, to do the test, we have this construct which um, says it's a value and okay, right? So I can um, I can get a value of 
of m of Adam like this. And if I do this, I will get zero if Adam is not there, right? But I, I cannot distinguish if Adam is there with zero or not. But if I do this second one, if I do okay or another variable, then it re will return bool uh, saying if the Adam was really there or not. So V will be zero, but then for Marius, I will have okay true. And for Adam, I will have okay false, right? And then to, to make it into a single statement, I am saying, if I don't care what the value really is, I'm care about okay equals to checking with Tom and okay is the Boolean expression with if is about, right? So there is an if statement where, which has initialization and then Boolean statement uh, and it's separated with a semicolon. So it's a special if statement we, where I have this initialization here, right? So now you may ask, okay, uh, is, is that, so if you keep that in mind, if you kept this statement in mind and I, I do this statement here, so uh, to be consistent with the question, I change it to Tom and I don't care about the thingy. And I say, if okay, um, format print line, okay, right? So now you can ask me, is this equivalent to this? And the answer is yes, of course it is equivalent. And why this is a more idiomatic way instead of this. If you come from C, or other or Java, you would probably tend to do this because you will you don't have in Java this uh, special if uh, with con uh, with initialization or or um, then you will probably do this this way, right? Uh, why you should not do it this way? Why should you do it this way? So the, the question is, I have two versions of, of um, why this complains. It doesn't complain anymore, yeah, perfect. So I will uh, do another version of this, which is, I, I will not type it, it's here, right? So this is ex doing exactly the same as this. The question is why you should do this this way rather than this way, exactly. So Dennis is correct. It limits the scope of my variables, right? Here, uh, my variables, especially if I used okay or if I use the V as well, uh, they, the, uh, the scope of my V and okay will live uh, all the way until they that curly bra brace, right? And that's not what we want. We don't want V and okay to live beyond my if statement. Whereas if I do it like this, no, the, the scope and lifetime of my variables only lives within this, this curly braces here. Uh, so after this curly brace, I don't pollute my space, my namespace with any variables which I don't need anymore, right? So uh, yes, we can have a break um, and I will, um, yeah, I will wrap it up by, by saying that this is the kind of an idiomatic way of doing it in Golang. And even if you're coming from Java or C, C++, you should try to not do this, even though it will work, you should try to do it this way. Uh, yeah, so let's have a break. Let's meet back at uh, 20 past 11. Is it okay? Yeah, there is a question. I will, uh, I will be here so I, I can answer questions. Um, I will just start the timer for people. So let, let's have eight minute break. Um, yes. Yeah, so the question is what does the underscore mean? Um, we use underscore in places where the expression or something returns a value, but we don't care about that value. And if I, so look, if I do this, uh, and I save it. Um, the linter and the compiler, and you know, they will complain. They will give me a warning saying, "Look, uh, you declared v, you assigned value to v, but you never used v. What the hell, right?" So to avoid those complaints, those errors or warnings, 
uh, what I can do is I can replace V uh, with underscore. And then if I save it, um, then the warning and whatever the complaints were are gone, right? So we use underscore in places where we need to return something from some pattern matching or, or some, not pat, there is no pattern matching in Golang, but like in, in this particular case from this uh, test, this test returns two things. And then I cannot, in this particular case, um, I can use a variant. So let's, let's have a situation where I say single thing equals M of Tom, right? I can do that. Um, I can do that, but V is not the test of existence of Tom. It's the value is this, um, this int, which is the value of the map, right? Um, in, and I can do that, but I will not get okay. What I want is okay, but I don't care about V. That's why we use underscore here. Um, and many times what happens is you have a function. So let's define a, a sim simple function uh, which returns two things. So I have a function f which doesn't take any anything and it returns um, it returns two ints, right? Um, or it returns an int and an error, right? So my function f return returns two two things. So uh, let's let's return. Um, let's return. Um, uh, number 10 and let's return um, new error, which is no error, right? It's a stupid function, which returns two things. Um, and then I will have to import, um, I have to import format and I need to import um, errors. Um, Okay, okay, okay. And then in here, if I try to do this, if I try to call my F uh, and I save it, uh, it will say, look, uh, you're trying to return one thing, but the function F returns two things, right? I cannot make this line. I cannot make an assignment uh, with a single thing. I have to make uh, two things, right? So I could do two things like, um, error and value, right? So if I save that, it will work. Oops, uh, it will complain that I'm not using V and E, right? Um, so let's um, let's use the error. So if I, I will say, if uh, error is different than nil, then print uh, not okay, right? So now I, I, I have E sorted. Um, no, it's not error, it's E. So um, let's do this. Now it's fine. Um, I have M, which is never used, <laughs> but, and I have V, which is never used. But um, uh, if I don't care about V, I can put uh, underscore here. And if I don't care about an error, I can put underscore here as well, right? So I can um, replace it with this. If I actually don't care about neither of them, I can replace it with uh, with just calling F, right? F will return two things, but I just don't care about them. So I don't do any assignment. Uh, and this will work, although uh, Golang will also uh, complain. Um, so I delete that, I do this. It complains about, so let's print, print line. Um, let's print M, that should work. Um, and then um, the, the setup that I have with my current IDE doesn't complain about me not checking for the error but in, in some linter setups and in some um, configurations of your syntax checker, uh, you should have a warning here saying that F returns an error and you don't check for it, right? Uh, such that you can ignore the values. Uh, if I had two values, then that would be correct and fine. But if you're returning an error and not checking about the error, then the linter you know, often complains if you have configured it like this. 
Um, okay, so what? Uh, Yeah, so there is a question about like in this case here, if I do, right, so let's remove, um, yeah, that's fine, that, that can stay, we just don't use F. Uh, if I say that value is uh, my map M of Tom, then uh, V, um, V will be 40, right? So Tom value is 40. And uh, V will be kind of the, the value of, of this will be bound to, to the variable V, right? Uh, so V is a mutable variable with a value of type int of value 40, right? Um, if, I set, if I set this with Adam, V would be zero, right? It will return me value zero. But if I say Mariusz, it will also be zero, right? That's um, the, the the kind of the logic of maps and default values. So uh, you cannot have. Um, so with slice, um, we we talked about slices. So uh, slice is an object, an object, and it can be nil. Right, nil is a default value for an empty slice of an empty object. Uh, int is a primitive type, uh, primitive type, and the default value is zero. Uh, float, same, primitive type, default value zero, and the you know the the um, larger floats and larger ints the same. Um, if I have a, a struct, so if I have a struct. Oh yeah, for string, string is also primitive type, uh, primitive type, uh, and the default value is empty string. Um, the default value of boolean, I don't remember what what it is. I hope it's false. <laughs> we can test it. So I can delete all of that, and I can uh, declare. I can say we have. Um, so we have v, which is, um, no, we have a variable v, which is of type bool, and then we can print v. I mean, it will have to have a, a default value. <laughs> uh, and we have two options. It can either be um, you know, true or false. Uh, this will not compile because, no, I'm using, I'm using error, okay? So that's, that's fine. So we save it, terminal. And we're gonna run it, go run main.go. It's false, yeah, so my guess was correct. Um, so the default value for bulls is false and so on. Uh, if I have a string, a struct, so if I say I have a type uh, student, which is a struct and the student has a name that is a string and age, that is an integer. And I, if I say V is student and I print it, I will not have nil. There is no nils for structs. The, I mean, there is like if it's a, kind of an empty struct, but with structs with, which have some stuff. And then the, the default value will be that string is um, empty string and age is zero, right? So if I print V, which we can do just to make sure that uh, I'm not lying to you, then it will be an empty string and zero, right? It's my kind of default student. Um, and uh, the underscore doesn't hold anything. So underscore is a syn syntactic sugar for telling the compiler that underscore means I don't care and underscore is not a variable. So for example, in Haskell and in some programming languages, underscore is a valid variable name and we use it to denote that, you know, uh, I kind of, I don't care, but in fact, it is like a, a, like a variable name like any other. In Golang, uh, the underscore is not 
a variable name and it will not hold anything, right? So to answer uh, a question, what will underscore hold in the original, um, so in the original uh, question, like uh, for example, underscore V uh, F, right? Uh, underscore, like if I do this uh, with my function F, underscore will not be 10. Uh, so in my, uh, like, you know, F returns 10 as a first thing, but underscore will not be 10. Like it underscore just means I don't care, right? <clears throat> yeah, that's right. So uh, if you replace it with something, if you replace it with X, then X will be 10 because, um, uh, because my function returns 10. And if we talk about Tom, like if we did this, um, so map, I don't have this map anymore, but you remember what the map was. And if I do this, then uh, X will be 40 uh, for Tom and V will be, uh, sorry, it, it will be true, right? And if I do this, then I don't care about the underscore, the X, but V will be true. And if I do this for Adam, then V will be zero and this will be false. And if I did it for Marius and Marius had zero, that would be true, right? Yeah. All right, so break is over. Uh, the break went over time. Um, all right, so leaderboard. Let's check the leaderboard. We should have some winners. Yes, we have some people who did things right. Uh, we don't really differentiate well. So the next two questions, uh, the next question is super easy. Unfortunately, I think it's still uh, 30 seconds, but if you fast, you get more points, right? So super easy question. Uh, this I don't need this all right perfect so I hope there were some correct answers although my I might have uh, I don't know how it does it with spaces and stuff. Like for example, this is a correct answer also, but it's without the space in the middle. So sorry for that. That's correct also. I just double check that it doesn't complain about the, it, it will be actually quite tricky because if I do this and I move my cursor, it doesn't check things yet. And if I save it, it does the, uh, auto formatting of the style, which means it will inject the space here and it will inject the new line. But I believe that if I delete that and keep it like this, it will keep it. No, it doesn't. Um, yeah, so, so perhaps, uh, I mean, you know, logically all those, all those will not be compile errors. So the spacing doesn't matter. So those should be correct answers, those three. Um, yeah, I did the, the space. Um, so uh, some people love loops and um, loops um, are the main idiomatic way of doing stuff in Golang. So slices and arrays because slices are backed by array but you know we often we much more often use slices than arrays in golang so slices and maps and loops are the three fundamental things that you will use a lot so any problem that you need to deal with most of the time will involve you know some of those um, there is really difficult to avoid using loops in golang um, the problem is um, that loops introduce boilerplate, right? 
So let's uh, let's have a quick quick check. Okay. So for example, um, infinite loop like this and kind of do something here. It's uh, it's a really nice uh, compact way of um, of doing infinite loop, right? In uh, in uh, Java and in C, you would have to do something like this, right? Um, you would have to say this and like, why do you need to say it, right? And here is a more compact way of saying the same thing without the boilerplate, right? This is kind of a boilerplate, like, um, yeah. Uh, all right, so in, in C or in Golang, um, you have a normal loop where you can say uh, for e being from ah oh, come on uh, being from zero, and then I have i less than some condition. I don't know. Uh, so let's do let's do a bit of a trick. So let's reintroduce our our map. So I have m, which is map. Um, I, let's not make it a map, let's make it a slice. I have a slice of ints and I have some ints, right? So um, like this, uh, I will cut that off. I will cut that off. So now I want to iterate over my M, right? So then what you would say is, okay, I would say um, <clears throat> length of M and uh, then you would say uh, I, plus plus or i plus one and then you will do something here with your m and your index right so kind of you would say do something here with um m of i of i right so this is kind of uh, <clears throat> uh yeah the the length is from haskell in golang it's called len <laughs> All right, so that will work and that's fine, right? That's a one loop that, that you can write, right? As you see, there is a lot of boilerplate. Like I have to type a lot and it annoys most of people, right? Some people love loops and they love this typing. I kind of don't. So in Golang, we have a different way of writing the same thing. So what we can do is we can say for index and value of my slice m do something with index. So index is my i, right? Same as with the previous loop. If I don't care about i, I can say I don't care. If I if I need i, I I can use it. But most of the time you actually don't care. And then if if all you cared was m of i, then this m of i is in here is v, right? So here kind of do something with V, right? Um, and I don't need to type those, uh, the, the access to M because I already have it in V, right? So this is, th those two loops are exactly the same. They do exactly the same thing. It's just that this one is a more compact way of expressing it and it has less boilerplate and I don't have to access those elements with M of I, I already have them as V. Right, so if I need to print them, I would just say print v, right? Uh, because I already did the binding here, uh, and as you see, it's kind of a, a simpler, shorter way of writing the the loop, right? So now, let's move on, and we know that um, um, yeah. So the next task is um, this is a, a not. A conceptual question. So write me in, in Golang that slice s is a slice of ints, like something like I did here. But this time it goes from one to thousand, right? Yes, you can type it, but I believe you will not be typing from one to thousand. So how would you do that? How would you make me m, which is or in this case s, right? So I, all I want is s, which is like m, but it goes from one to thousand. So what would you do in Golang? How would you do it? I will give you more time. Um, 
Yeah, let's try it. Okay, I will delete these loops. And that answer um, kind of doesn't work. I know. I I would like to say it like this as well. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can't do it like this. So um, exactly, you kind of need something like this. Uh, you do need to do a loop, which adds. Um, adds elements, uh, you know, to correctly do it, like you would need to do something like for i equals from one, um, i is less than 1001 and i equals i plus one. Um, and then you would have to say, I have uh, a slice. So you would say, I have S, which is a slice. Um, because you know that it's gonna have thousand elements, right? So actually the efficient way of doing it would be to say, I want to make a slice, which is a slice of ints. And I know currently it has a zero length, but I know it will have thousand elements such that I kind of pre-allocate pre um, the size of S already here. And then what you could do is you would say um, S equals uh, append S I, right? So if we do this and we delete M because we're not using it, and then we say uh, format print line s and uh, save it, it would kind of work. But it just like, what the hell is this, right? Uh, so I feel your pain and I feel something like that would be what I would like to have. So that's what, you know, that the de facto answer that I said, like, I would like to be able to do this, you can't. And the question is why can't you do that in Golang? And the answer is, I don't know, <laughs> right? Um, some languages have it, some don't, but you know, those that do feel kind of modern and they feel kind of better and languages they don't, they feel yeah, like, why? Why would you not do this this way, right? Uh, in the language. Um, and especially because we do have this, uh, like th the only syntactic sugar they would need is this, this triple dots. Uh, because the rest of the syntax is already there. We already do this initialization for some small items like that as long as we can type it, right? Um, all right, so Golang doesn't have it. In Golang, you use a loop, right? All right, next question. Uh, do the same, um, but we, um, yeah, I, I used the wrong type for this, for this slide. Uh, but the question was, um, how would you define slice the same as before, but you just want a consecutive powers of two. So what you want is two to the powers of zero, two to the powers of one, two to the powers of two, two to the powers of three, up to the two to the powers of 10. How would you do that in Golang? And again, the answer is, well, you kind of do it like this. You uh, write a loop. Uh, you say, I go from zero to 10, right? Um, and then I will append to my slice i uh, like two to the power of i, right? Um, because I have to use a loop. And the um, preferred way would be to have something like this uh, that I say, well, you know, I have some sort of a range from zero to 10. Uh, I generate the two to the powers of that p. And that's my my slice, right? Uh, I, you know, I would have to put uh, the int slice here uh, in front. So in some languages, you have this syntax. It's called uh, 
list or slice or you know array comprehension uh, but in golang you don't uh, so in golang you use list um, you use loop right so for most things that we in some languages which we, we can use something else in golang we use loops and um, that's fine like if you're coming from C C++ or Java you don't have list comprehensions or um, you know uh, slices comprehensions and you don't have those ranges necessary neither such that you know writing loops is fine for you but uh, for some of you coming from other programming languages you may say oh, why do I don't have it and yeah you don't so you write loops uh, so you will use loops more often than not in, in Golang we have some exercises after uh, where you will need to use loops uh, in other languages you could use something else all right, so then we, we move on. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I will try to stop saying mm, um, but it's hard. It's, uh, yeah, I, I, but I will work on it. All right, so we have a leaderboard um, and we have some people who did the for loop correctly and they will uh, gain but none of the people who did the other thing correctly kind of uh, got the for loop correctly. So yeah, congratulations on, on you guys. Um, let's do, let's do, um, let's do a more functional problem now. So a simple function that adds two numbers, right? Uh, you should be able to do that. Um, so I will delete this. Yeah, let's leave the student. Uh, so the idea is a simple function that adds two ints. You can do it in one line. So, I mean, you should do it in one line to get the points. So you you did it correctly, but you know it's a it's a limitation of the com computer uh, checks. So for example, I defined the two integers in a in this way, but of course you can define it in this way. So this is a correct answer. Uh, this is fine. Um, this is a correct answer without the. Yeah, I mean you do need. Uh, th this is almost a correct answer. Uh, this is also almost a correct answer. The, it lacks types. So this is not a correct answer because you have to specify the return type. Uh, so the return type um, you have to say, so we have a function add uh, which takes two parameters. Now you have an option. You can, if the parameters are of the same type, you can do this or you can do this, right? Uh, whatever you prefer. Uh, I actually prefer this longer version with the more boilerplate, uh, but I think more idiomatic way in Golang is to do this, okay? And then you define a return type. In our case, the return type is just int. Uh, if you have more than one stuff that you return, you can return multiple things. Um, unlike C++ or Java, where you are restricted to returning a single thing, here you can return multiple things and you can do this pattern matching of, you know, a, B, C, if I'm returning th three things from my add, uh, and I could do this, right? Uh, I can return three things and bind those three things to A, B, C, right? Um, so if you are returning multiple things, you have to put a round bracket again. So if I were to return two things, I have to do this, but if I'm returning one thing, I don't need a bracket. And then I have a body of the function. Um, and then, I could do it in one line, but if I save it, it would split it into two lines and then you return A plus B, right? Um, so this is the uh, this return. This is the structure of your definition of a function. Um, so let's move on. We have the leaderboard. We have already uh, checked it. Uh, and then uh, I will spend a little bit more time on uh let me see yeah so i i will try to do that um 
uh, sorry. Uh, yes, so we can make it more complex and functions are type in, in itself. So for example, I can say, I take, um, I have a function which takes one integer and it returns a function which also take one integer, but I want a different variable name for it. And that second function returns an int, okay? So now I have a function at which has a single parameter. Um, so let, let, let me do it like this. I will have uh, at two, no, at one, and I will have function at which take the original one, which uh, takes um, two things, returns one thing and uh, return a plus b. And then I have here, I have um, x that is at uh, one and two. Okay, so x, of course, x is three. And then I have y, which is at one, and I will put one here. And now this function returns me a function which also takes one integer, right? So here we have to, oops, here we have to return a function. So how do we return a function? Well, we, def we declare a new function, which is called func and um, it takes one uh, parameter. So uh, it takes, uh, let's call it X and returns int because this is what I need here. Um, I don't need to name this parameter, right? So, and in fact, I'm not sure if I should name it because I only specify the type. So my function takes one int and returns an int. And I don't care what name you know does it have because the name comes here in my declaration of that function. So then I will uh, do <coughs> return, and I need to return an int. So I will return a plus x, right? So here, when I do this, the question is what is y? And the answer is it's a function. Y is a function. Right, uh, I can define a new function. I can call. I, I can define a function a, which is a function, which is a func, uh, which takes um, two parameters, which are ints, returns an int, and it's defined as um, a plus b. And then I can say, I can call a. I can call a with one and two. Right. So all of that is fine. Um, yeah, it complains that I'm not using, using X. Um, so all of that is fine. Uh, so you can have variables which are functions. So Y in this case is a function which takes one parameter. And if I call it, if I supply the second parameter, then I will effectively achieve um, that Y is now y is not anymore a function, y is a value and the value is three, right? Uh, it's the same, th those two things are e exactly the same. So this and this are the same, it's just that this is called with two parameters, it's a single function with two parameters. And here I have a function which returns me a function, but effectively it's doing the same thing. This pattern looks kind of trivial. You, you can ask like, yeah, why would you ever do this? Um, and the answer is that in Golang and in, in uh, some other functional programming languages, we, we actually do that quite a lot because we need to pass something somewhere. And when we are doing the passing, the, the thing that we passing to expects certain signature and we need additional parameters or we need less parameters and we need to do these adjustments. Uh, and formally, like uh, for those of you who are doing advanced programming, th this is called carrying. Um, so we are kind of like, I cannot call at only with the first parameter without the second one yet, right? I can only call at with both or I cannot call it. Whereas here I can call at with the first parameter already ready, already bound. And I can vary what I do with the second one, right? So for example, here, 
I actually I am not interested in um, in Y's in a single Y. I'm interested in multiple Y's. And for the multiple Y's, I need a loop and I will call it with the second parameter, right? So if I have this function FY, I will call it in a loop with some parameter X. So I, I can do like X from one to 10, and then I will get 10 answers. Uh, whereas with the first case, I would have to do at one comma and do the big function 10 times, right? Uh, you, you, again, you may ask, well, what is the big deal here? Like in this particular case, it makes no difference, but there is something called a scope. And for example, for the inner function, like if we had slightly more complicated thing and we were talking about, yeah, let's, let's make a, a more complicated thing. So I will show you, um, let's do, um, okay, so, Let's clean that and let's talk uh, one too many. Uh, let's do a different struct. So structs um, um, containers that represent like NC and Java, it's kind of the same. They represent some sort of a structured data. Um, and then what we can do is we can store a count of some sort. And then I can call it a counter. Um, and then I can make a function here that um, I can, for example, have a function that uh, increments a counter for me and I can call it, um, so I will need a C, which is a counter and then I will say that um, C count equals C count plus one, right? Uh, so this is my counter. And then in my function somewhere, I will kind of need to declare it. So I will, for example, say I have a global counter, right? And the global counter is, uh, is a new counter. Um, new counter, and then I will somewhere increment it, right? So I will say I want to pass uh, my global counter reference, and then my increment will increment the counter. So here we have a couple of elements. We have a struct. Uh, because I'm doing everything in main, I don't need to export anything outside. I'm using small letters uh, such that those are not publicly available anywhere else. And I have declared and initialized an, an empty counter from zero because the default value here is zero. And then I'm calling ink to increment the, uh, the, the counter. Uh, to make ink somewhat useful, uh, let's, return, uh, let's return the current count, right? So I will kind of return C count. Okay, so now I can ask, okay, uh, somewhere in my code, I can ask, okay, what is the current count uh, when I need to increment it? And then I'm kind of using A. Make sense? Uh, what would be the difference if I did pass, the, pass it by value and expect it by value? Uh, would that work? No, it would not work because I'm, I'm passing something by value. I, I'm incrementing it. And then I'm returning the count of that stuff that I passed by value and then it disappears such that uh, my uh, global counter would always be um, zero because I haven't really incremented that counter. I incremented the copy by value of the of the counter that has been passed here. So this will always return one and it would kind of not work. So for that we need pointers and we need kind of um, um, you know the the reference to to that uh, to that struct right so I can make it differently um, and I can effectively say global counter is a reference to a counter. So I can do this, right? Uh, and that would work also. Uh, so I initiated 
a, a value counter and I got the reference to it. And now I'm kind of operating on the same reference all the time here. Uh, so that would work too. Uh, but if I get the, the value one, the, the value of the new counter, then I have to reference it down there. Um, so I can do that. So one um, note that um, it would be normally uh, that I, if I'm using struct like this, I would make it into a package, which is called counter. Uh, if I if I want if, if it by any means something useful for other people, right? Uh, then I would make it kind of a cap capitalized, um, and then I would have. Um, I'm not gonna do it because it's too much typing, but you will see the idea. And then in that package, I would have a function which is called new, uh, also capitalized, and that function new would take no parameters and it would return me. Uh, this counter cap capital letter. Um, and usually you don't want it to be by value, you want it to be done by reference. So, you know, you would have a function new which returns a new counter. And yeah, let me type it because otherwise it's a little bit confusing. So uh, it's capitalized and then this is capitalized and the new is capitalized. And then um, this idiomatically you can do by doing return uh, reference to counter, which is empty, right? So that is sort of the idiomatic way of writing initializations in your Golang uh, code, uh, such that here I would kind of call, I would have my package, I would have some something, something, something dot new, and then uh, new would kind of return me a new counter, right? So now I have sort of, um, made it a little bit better and you learned of how you normally do this. So normally there is a function which initiate, initiates something. Uh, why would you want that? Uh, what is the difference between just doing that in here? Uh, well, the dif in this particular case, there is no difference, but usually what you want is you don't want to do this like this. You want to do something with it such that maybe I, I want to start counter from one. Right, so I want to start from one, uh, or maybe I have some extra elements here that I need to initiate into different values than default values, such that this new will do it for me. So it's like a constructor, right? Um, so why do we use constructors? Well, for the purpose of initialization, and that's why we tend to do this this way. Um, if you happen to not put it, it would only make sense if I put it into a package called counter, right? That would kind of make sense and it would make sense to call it new only because it's obvious that it's from counter. But in, the, in this case, because I'm doing it in the same package, it would, be, it would make more sense to call it new counter and then just do it like, um, so new and the type uh, like this, right? Does it make sense? So, all right, we have this counter, we have the global counter, and we have a lot of machinery just to do this stupid thing of counting something and having a value out of it, right? So there is a, a simpler way without this global way, without this global uh, variable here, and without all this extra machinery of how to achieve it. And the, um, the way to achieve it is um, by having a function called make counter. Uh, which takes no parameters, or if you want to start from a particular value, you could parameterize it, and it returns a function which um, doesn't take any parameters and returns you an int, uh, and it works like this. I have uh, a count here, which is zero, or if you want to parameterize it, I could take this initial value, value here, uh, so I would have my counter here, and then I return a function which takes a single parameter called x, which is an, ah, it doesn't actually, because we're incrementing it by, um, by one, by default, it returns int and it returns counter. Well, I need to first increment counter. Counter equals counter plus one and it returns counter counter, right? And the, um, 
the way I would use it is, so now instead of having this increment function and the counter and the counter type and the placeholder of where it is and initializing my counter and then using it, all I need is I need to say, uh, make counter. Make counter. And then I have some global counter, which is a function actually. Uh, and then I just do A is, I call it, right? So now I have um, a closure, uh, which keeps track of what my global count is inside this function, um, inside this function, because this function has a closure of the count. And by just uh, making the counter and kind of calling it, I will keep track of how many times this global counter was called because this function has a kind of a state that it carries along with it uh, where every time I call at counter. Okay. Um, you uh, with um, yes, with global counters, you can just have a global variable and you kind of increment it. Uh, but you may have problems with it if you have multiple threads accessing it and you want to make it thread safe and if you want to do some extra things. Uh, so th this is not an idiomatic way of doing global counters. It's just kind of a, a using a counter as an example of why you may want to be returning functions from functions or why you may want to pass functions to functions to achieve kind of encapsulation and certain behavior that otherwise you would need to use structs or some kind of a hanging types that you don't really need. So in here, I don't need to have kind of the, a counter type, like a placeholder of, of where I store it. I don't even need a variable, like an int variable outside of this context. I, you know, nobody should see that I have a variable, which is the counter. And that's what this solution solves. It kind of hides um, this counter inside the function itself and it's not visible anywhere outside of, of the call to this, to this function, right? Uh, it doesn't exist. Um, yeah, the counter plus plus, yes, you, you can use that uh, in Golang as well. So you can uh, simplify the notation with the plus plus notation. Yes, correct. All right, so uh, we run out of time. We have small number of slides left, uh, but those are not, um, super important. So we've done this. Um, so the, some of the functional patterns we, we covered and it has more functional patterns than, than that. We will cover more later. Uh, we played with the, uh, with the passing functions to functions and generating functions. So we, we kind of did that. We didn't do them up. So we, we haven't done um, a method on a struct which operates on that method and then apply it. But you can kind of do it. It's, it's super easy, like you can do it as a homework. Um, so what I would like you to do, if you are attending tomorrow, uh, we will start with this tomorrow. Uh, and if you're not attending tomorrow, do it as a homework. So imagine that you have um, a, a slice of, of, um, of ints and then your task is to count occurrence of those ints and find which one is the most frequent and if there are two most frequent ones but they so they have the same count but they are different then select the smaller one right so in this particular case uh, we have kind of sequence like this and number one is repeated three times um, so the answer is one if two was repeated three times also, the answer would still be one because uh, two is larger than one. So you pick the smaller one, okay? Um, so the task is you, you get a slice. Um, so the task is like this. You get a slice um, of int as a string because those, um, it's not really a slice yet. Of course, it, it's just a string of numbers. So you, you get it like this. You get it as a string of numbers you have to extract all the elements from it. And then you have to count the occurrence and you have to print which one is the most frequent, right? So the, the function looks like this. Um, 
the function looks like this, find ID. It takes the string and returns an int. Uh, so think, first think how would you do that in pseudocode? How would you approach this problem? Um, so how would you kind of count those, those occurrences? Uh, and then code it in Go, right? So first think on a pseudocode level, how would you solve it? And then try to code it in Go. Um, if, if in your pseudocode, you're not using loops, you will need to recode it, like translate your pseudocode into loops because in Go, you are, that's what you are stuck with, okay? Um, all right, so there is, um, there is no questions in the, in the, yeah, I already covered that. So I didn't cover it, I didn't solve it. I'm, I'm, I'm more aware of it. And probably because of that, I'm saying um, even more. Uh, yeah, I, I will try. Um, so take a note of, of this problem and think solving it in pseudocode and solving it in Go. I'm interested in, in pseudocode as well. So I am interested in your approach to solving that, that problem. It, it, it's a very simple problem, but it has um, a small twist. And, and the twist is that you need to pick the smallest one. Um, so you will realize that that is a bit of a twist to the problem. Uh, all right, so that's for tomorrow or for as a homework. Um, and then those people who are interested, please join tomorrow morning. We will do 8.30. We will start with this problem and we will continue with a little bit of a look at problem solving using Golang uh, compared to problem solving using other languages uh, because Golang has a kind of a simpler attitude towards uh, more complex problems and it expresses the solutions sort of using loops. Uh, whereas other languages, you might be a little bit more clever of how you're solving them. So tomorrow is, is more about the language. And then um, what we will do on, on Tuesday is we will do web services and accessing web APIs. So we will use a HTTP package from Golang and we will play with, uh, with some ways of um, doing the requests like um, HTTP requests like I did here, for example, like um, for generating the, the get request and accessing the API and getting some JSON back. And also we will talk about writing uh, web applications using the built-in um, net HTTP package such that you, if you want, you can read about the introduction to net HTTP package and play with those uh, simple handlers for your HTTP request, but we will do that on Tuesday. So that's the plan for the next two sessions. And that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions, please ask, and I will be here for a moment to, um, to let you ask. So um, the, the tasks in the uh, advanced programming, they don't have a deadline yet. Uh, the tasks in, uh, in the cloud, I posted some, uh, if you go to the wiki, I posted some tasks for uh, Golang. So like a basic programming tasks, let me quickly check. Yeah, there's a simple Fibonacci. Uh, the zero argument thing we've already done. Um, yeah, so this is the uh, this is the basically no, that's not the, the same one. That's a different one. Yeah, so we, we will discuss like the task number five tomorrow as well. Um, yeah. Um, no, there is no deadline. You can kind of do it at your, uh, at your own pace. Uh, and then the assignment, uh, we will talk with Christopher for the cloud uh, assignment, what that will be, but it will be more about the, the cloud services and the rest APIs than about Go itself. Um, yeah. So no, no deadlines yet, but 
advice to work on on your on your tasks kind of on a regular basis <laughs> if you can and for this one for for this task that the deadline is tomorrow we're gonna discuss it like uh tomorrow so if you can solve this problem um then bring it along and we will uh discuss any other questions If not, I will stop.